All right, let's go ahead and get started for today. So in our previous lecture, uh, we spent time trying to explore the uh, cell cytoskeleton. And uh, one of the functions of the, cytoskele of the cytoskeleton is to kind of serve as a track for uh, a class of proteins called molecular motors. And we'll be talking about that today in the context of heart failure. Heart failure can be defined as when a person's heart cannot adequately pump uh, enough blood to meet the body's demand. And that, uh, that problem can be kind of distilled down to a decreased contractility of the heart. Some of the symptoms that are associated with uh, heart failure are dyspnea, uh, which we defined before as a shortness of breath or trouble breathing, wheezing, uh, also edema, uh, edema can be defined as uh, fluid buildup. Uh, it's also characterized by fatigue, nausea, uh, impaired thinking, and interestingly, incre increased heart rate. The increased heart rate uh, can largely be attributed to, if you think back to the equation for uh, cardiac output from your physiology class, that's not going to work. Product output equals stroke volume times heart rate. As in, an, in a compensatory mechanism to try and keep cardiac output the same. So if there's decreased contractility, that means the amount of blood per beat, that's the kind of unit for stroke volume, this is going down. So heart rate will go up to compensate for that to maintain the cardiac output. So what you learn in other classes kind of carry through your other BME classes. Uh, it's not the last time you'll see that formula, I guarantee you. Um, some of the causes of heart failure. Uh, coronary artery disease is one. So that's uh, typically defined by uh, the coronary arteries are the um, small arteries on the blood on your uh, on your heart that supply uh, uh, blood and oxygenation to the actual uh, heart muscle, to your actual uh, uh, cardiomyocytes there. And what ends up happening as the plaque buildup occurs in those coronary arteries, that's a part of coronary artery disease, when that plaque becomes dislodged, it becomes a blood clot that can go through and then um, completely obstruct your coronary arteries that leads to a myocardial infarction, which is the proper clinical term for a heart attack. So typically coronary artery disease leads to a myocardial infarction and typically what happens is if you have complete blockage of that coronary artery to that part of your heart, that region of your heart, uh, they call that the infarct zone or the infarct region, that region becomes, uh, it, it becomes necrotic, it dies, and it becomes scar tissue. So that region of your heart muscle that previously was contributing to contraction and contractility is now scar, which is stiff and is not gonna contribute to contraction any longer. Uh, another cause of heart failure is hypertension. Uh, does anyone uh, want to define hypertension for us really quickly? High blood pressure. Yeah. So it uh, is defined as high blood pressure. And part of the reason is now there's a, uh, a greater threshold of contraction to meet, to overcome that higher blood pressure to eject blood out of the heart. Uh, another ca other causes are abnormal heart valves. Uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So that's basically an enlarging of the uh, cardio, uh, an enlarging, hyper, hypertrophy is just basically, hypertrophic or hypertrophy is just like a, getting, a, getting larger. And that's the getting larger of the heart muscle. Uh, congenital heart disease. Uh, does anyone want to define congenital for us? Yes? Yes. So it's uh, one cause is potentially uh, some congenital heart defect that you're born with. It's something that you're born with. Uh, also diabetes, uh, and finally viral infection. Uh, this is typically can be described as uh, myocarditis as a result of some viral infection, which has probably been on the news constantly for the last three years uh, as it relates to COVID-19, but is also true with the flu. Um, you can almost think of it as the heart remembers, meaning that with previous viral infections like the flu or with COVID-19, uh, 
uh, there are there are instances of myocarditis that is an inflammation of the heart muscle or uh, and it can affect the ability of your heart to contract properly for possibly for the rest of your life. Um, and so that's part of the reason why, for example, at, uh, here at the UVA Health Center and at many health centers, flu, flu vaccines are, uh, are a requirement. And so I encourage you all to get your flu vaccines if you haven't. Um, the statistics, uh, 5.1 million people in the U.S. have heart failure. And so compared to some of the other prevalence and incidence rates we've seen, these are going to be a lot higher, as you can imagine. Uh, typically, one. this is historic data, uh, one in nine deaths back in 2009. Uh, included heart failure as a cause of death. And typically of those who have heart failure, 50% of them will likely die in five years. Uh, and so this is a really, I wanna make sure I pick, I, I pick a right term here. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very serious clinical problem with serious uh, fatal consequences. And there's also, uh, and this data is a little older here as well for the direct expenditures. Uh, the the cost of heart failure is actually, is quite large as well. The heart the cost of heart failure, direct expenditure wise, is forty four billion dollars a year. To put that in context, the current NIH budget, the main um, body that funds research in our uh, in the United States, their budget I think was fifty five million fifty five billion dollars this past year. So this data is this day is a little bit older. So I suspect the direct expenditures uh, associated with heart failure exceeds the main body that provides funding for all research in the United States. Uh, there's also a geographic uh, component to it where primarily along the uh, Southern United States, uh, the rates of heart failure among those older than 35 is a lot higher. Uh, and there's also typically regions where there's lower rates of heart failure that can be attributed to uh, a variety of things, whether it's um, regions of the United States that have higher socioeconomic status or ho seemingly higher rates of activity level. Um, the, those are areas that typically have lower rates of heart failure. Um, so we're going to tie heart failure. We're going to use that as our context to uh, explore and understand molecular motors today. And molecular motors are really uh, important because they help contribute to cargo transport throughout our cells. And all of you might be asking yourselves, why is cargo transport important? Uh, that, that's an active process, uh, whereas if it was a passive process by diffusion, uh, you could that could be modeled by this random, random walk simulation of some diffusing particle to the bottom left here, where the ab ability of a particle to diffuse from one location to another would look like a random walk. And if you looked at the average displacement in the bottom right uh, over time, uh, it would, it would describe, it demonstrates that the diffusion is a non-linear uh, and it travels less over time. Uh, to use the uh, Stokes-Einstein equation here, uh, and to, uh, to give you a little context, typically when we think of Einstein, we think of the theory of relativity. While he's a PhD student, he decided to adjust other people's work uh, because grad students have so much extra time. Lionel, I imagine you can attest to that. Uh, and to find a new formula for uh, particle diffusion. So if you any of you are going to grad school, uh, I hope you all have the pleasure of uh, following in Einstein's footsteps and defining new equations. Um, but he took uh, an equation to try and define what diffusion looks like. And, and the assumption for this, for this formula, for the Stokes-Einstein equation, is that it is a particle, it is a spherical particle, and there's a low Reynolds number in the medium through which it's diffusing. And so to give some context uh, for some of the constants here, uh, the KB, the Boltzmann constant, is amount of energy per unit of temperature. And as you can imagine, as temperature goes up, there's more units of energy that, uh, that are present. Uh, T is absolute temperature. Uh, uh, and it, it is the visc viscosity of the medium. Uh, and as you can imagine, the, the, as temperature goes up, as, uh, as temperature goes up, the ability of a particle to diffuse through some medium goes up because there's more energy. Uh, it's important to be able to think about throughout this class as well as some, uh, some other classes. If you think about temperature as it relates to energy, as it relates to movement, whether it's a protein on a cell membrane or some particle in some medium moving with higher degree, with higher literally degrees uh, in temperature, there's more energy and more 
actual movement, whether it's Brownian motion or again, um, a protein on a plasma membrane. And as you can imagine, as the viscosity, uh, viscosity is in, uh, indirectly proportional to the mean displacement here. Uh, as viscosity goes up, the ability for a particle to diffuse goes down. As you can imagine, it's easier for something to go through water as compared to say jello. And so as the viscosity goes up, the ability for uh, random diffusion goes down. Uh, and finally, N is the dimensionality. Uh, and that's, and what's, what's helpful to note here is if you think about the ability, the degrees of freedom, kind of like in statistics, in this case, there's actual degrees of freedom as dimensionality goes up. And so if we were to use this formula to, to try and derive uh, some protein diffusing through some uh, water-like medium, uh, or sorry, for a, through a cytoplasm, and it, the viscosity of cytoplasm is about a thousand times higher than water, it would take about 700,000 years for a ribosome to diffuse down the length of one axon. And so because it would take so long for that random diffusion to occur, we need an active process by which molecular motors uh, mediate that transport. Yes. I should define that. Uh, that's mean displacement, like literally the, uh, the distance over which it, uh, the particle is traveling. And it is uh, to the power of two because whether it's, uh, if it was just displacement, uh, mean squared displacement, that's what it is. If it was just displacement, if I step to the right, and if I step to the left, I have no displacement, but I've moved. I've moved uh, two steps or two units of, of distance. And so we, uh, it's mean square displacement because it accounts for the uh, movement in different uh, X directions along, along that plane, even if my net displacement, my, even though if I, uh, my net displacement is the same spot. Does that make sense? Thank you for asking that question. I should have defined what the equation is actually solving for. So uh, molecular motors. Uh, these molecular motors are primarily enzymes whose primary function is to take chemical en energy and to uh, transform it into mechanical work. You can also kind of think of them as transducers. They're, they're taking one form of energy and transforming it into another form, chemical to mechanical. And typically the chemical energy can come in the form of ATP, GTP, or some electrochemical gradient. For today's lecture, we're going to focus primarily on ATP. And again, motion is always the end goal. The, the, these molecular motors are trying to mediate either transport or some, uh, some kind of displacement as it relates uh, to uh, molecular motors in a cytoskeleton, but motion is always the goal, whether it's cell contraction or cargo transport. So, these molecular motors use our cytoskeleton as a track to uh, accomplish either that contraction or cargo transport. Uh, the molecular motors that use uh, our microtubulin or tubulin cytoskeleton are kinesins and dynenes. Kinesins are molecular motors that move towards the positive end. Dynenes move towards the negative end. Uh, and the molecular motor that uses our actin cytoskeleton is called myosin and they're only typically moving towards the positive end. Uh, and what's important to note is that there's lots of different uh, isoforms of myosin, but we'll talk about just a couple of them today uh, for simplicity's sake. There are no motors, so I wanna repeat what I said earlier. Uh, kinesin moves towards the positive end, dynein moves towards the negative end. Myosin on the actin side of skeleton moves towards the positive end. Now, there are no motors that use our intermediate filaments. Does anyone eventually guess why? Because they don't have directionality. Exactly. So our intermediate filaments, because they don't have directionality, molecular motors do not use them as a track. Uh, in some ways, you can make a case for, microtub or for tubulin and actin for themselves to be kind of a motor, uh, because uh, particularly actin, they push on things as they polymerize. When we think of our actin side of skeleton, uh, nucleating at the uh, cell membrane and kind of pushing it during cell motility. You can think of it as taking chemical energy and turning it into mechanical work. Uh, 
but it's uh, but it's not to the degree as our molecular motors that we're going to talk about today. So some of the ways in which these molecular motors are regulated. Uh, there are binding sites that are blocked on actin that regulate uh, the myosin molecular motor. And so there, it's going to be different for striated muscle, muscle myosin. And striated muscle is typically either skeletal or cardiac. Uh, and for everything else, uh, the way in which that's regulated is mo the motor head becoming unavailable for binding. And so these are going to be the two ways in which we talk about molecular motors today as it relates to either uh, striated muscle versus non-striated muscle. Before we jump, uh, jump ahead and start talking about striated muscle uh, regulation, are there any questions so far? I'm going to stop for water and allow for any questions to percolate. Yes. Yeah, so there's, uh, so typically, non when we talk about non smooth muscle, there are also other isoform myosin that are present in cell populations, but for, for simplicity's sake today, we're going to focus on smooth muscle for the non striated um, application of, or regulation of uh, actin myosin interactions. Yes. Yes. So those are molecular motors that bind to tubulin. They they use tubulin as their track. Myosin uses actin as its track. Uh, ky uh, kinesin and dynein use tubulin. And the main difference between those two is their, uh, which direction they go in. So kinesin moves towards the positive end, and dynein moves towards the negative end. Mm-hmm. So first, the regulation of contraction in striated muscle. Again, striated muscle is skeletal or cardiac muscle. And so the way in which this is accomplished is by uh, inhibiting or permitting myosin binding to actin, OK? And the, uh, there's the, the inhibition that regulates that. That inhibition is blocked by calcium. So when you think about contracting. So this is, this is striated muscle, so it's total cardiac. So if you imagine picking up something, uh, uh, picking up your notebook or your pen, the this crude generalization here, but typically you'll have uh, at the neuromuscular junction between your nerves and your muscles, you'll have a neurotransmitter release that communicates with your skeletal muscle. There's going to be calcium release uh, in response to that neurotransmitter trigger. That, that calcium release is going to block the inhibition of actin and myosin communicating with each other. So the release of calcium as a response from neurons firing and activating muscles, uh, that calcium release is inhibiting an inhibitor. I realize I'm pointing over there because that's what I'm looking at. I should be pointing up here. Forgive me. Uh, so an inhibitor. So it inhibits an inhibitor, which is a disinhibition. So any form of disinhibition, you can think of it as, in, as inhibiting inhibitor, okay? And in this case, what ends up happening is during muscle contraction, there's a, neuro, there's a neural trigger response from our neuron firing and uh, communicating with your muscle cells. And that will prompt calcium stores to release calcium. And now this calcium is gonna act on blocking the inhibitor to permit contraction, whether it's in our cardiac muscle or in your skeletal muscle. And this is uh, based primarily on thin filament. So what you can appreciate is to the bottom left image here, this is a historic bright field image of uh, skeletal muscle. And we used to define things by the M band, the Z band, and from uh, between uh, Z bands, we'd have what we call the sarcomere. Uh, but now with more information, we have illustration on the bottom right here that helps to define some of the different molecules that are present. We have our actin film, thin filament. Uh, we have the thick filament in the middle, uh, myosin. In this case, because it's striated muscle, it's myosin 2. That's the species of myosin that we're going to be focusing on for uh, our striated muscle. And the 
interface between myosin. So we have these little bodies. They come almost like all uh, where the actin thin filament and the myosin have. And typically, what is inhibiting, normally inhibiting myosin from binding to actin is something called uh, tropomyosin. So actin is this beaded structure going across the top here. And there's this colorful uh, weaving band that goes around it. That's tropomyosin. On the bottom, we have our myosin filament with their uh, two large heads, uh, the myosin heavy chains. And uh, structured around the bottom of the myosin heavy chains are the two light chains. We have the essential light chain and the regulatory light chain. We're actually going to come back later in the lecture to talk about the regulatory light chain. That's going to be important for what we discuss later. But for now, the main takeaway here uh, that I want you to know is that this uh, structure around actin, tropomyosin, blocks the ability of myos the myosin heavy chain from binding to actin. Now, there's, these, there's this unique little protein complex uh, on different parts of tropomyosin. It's called the troponin protein complex, and it has three components to it. Uh, and so the troponin complex, uh, most things that we've discussed about protein and how they're naming or the nomenclature from the past uh, can be a little problematic or hard to follow. Troponin is great. So it makes sense and it's super great to follow. So troponin T is the tropomyosin binding unit. Troponin I is the inhibitory subunit. And troponin C is the calcium binding subunit. Uh, and because it is subunit, that means each of them are individual proteins that come together to make this protein complex, tropon uh, the troponin protein complex, that all works together uh, to regulate tropomyosin. So troponin T, the tropomyosin binding unit, and troponin I, the inhibitory subunit, with that tropomyosin uh, filament that's wrapped around actin, uh, they together inhibit myosin from binding to actin. I'm going to repeat that one last time. The troponin T subunit and the troponin I subunit, with the tropomyosin filament that wraps around actin, together they inhibit myosin from binding to actin. Now, this is a recent, uh, uh, recent uh, structure defined of uh, tropomyosin and the troponin protein complex. And so we have our uh, tropomyosin uh, and going around. We have our actin filament in gray in the background. We have our troponin protein complex here with troponin T, troponin I, and troponin C in the middle. Uh, and if we zoom in on the troponin, troponin protein complex, and what was in purple here, the troponin C complex, this little red amino acid residue here in the very middle here, that's the calcium binding region, the, the, the site at which calcium binds the troponin C subunit. And that binding is really important, and we're going to talk about why that's important. So... The binding of calcium to troponin C, uh, as you can imagine, uh, calcium has a charge. The binding of something with a charge to a protein is going is to is gonna change the charge of that pro protein and elicit a conformational change. So what's going to end up happening is calcium binding to troponin C is going to elicit conformational change. That's consequences to the surrounding other troponin subunits. Now there are there is an older older school of thought and a newer school of thought of what happens after calcium binds to troponin C. Uh, historically, the school of thought was that once that conformational change occurs, it transmit it it transmits that change to troponin T and troponin I, the tr tro tropomyosin binding unit and the inhibitory unit uh, that will actively move and push tropomyosin uh, and opens up the myosin binding site to actin. So we have our tropomyosin there. Once uh, calcium comes in, 
uh, binds to troponin C. The older school of thought thinks would say that tropomyosin is actively pushed, uh, making space for tropomyosin to bind to actin here. The slightly newer school of thought says that after calcium binds to troponin C, uh, it will un uh, it will unlock the inhibitory subunit. So what that looks like is it's going to enable free diffusion of tropomyosin, leaving space for myosin to bind to actin. I'm going to push pause there and give space for any questions. Yes. So are these in theory or if I think it's not necessarily disproven, uh, rather. It's not an active pushing that's occurring of uh, of tropomyosin away from the myosin binding site of, on actin, uh, but rather that like, it's this. And it got about this point that there's nothing to, from what we know. There's no like active movement, but rather it appears that there's just general more freedom and movement of uh, diffusing away of tropomyosin that leaves space. For myosin to come and bind to actin. So it's not that it's been dis disproven, but rather new findings seem to support this newer, th this newer idea that explains how um, calcium activation occurs in striated muscle. Yes. So let me define. So uh, this red line is tropomyosin. Uh, these beads are actin, and that blue, these smaller blue circles are myosin binding sites on actin. And this uh, Y with uh, two ovals on top. So the idea is once calcium comes, it binds to troponin C. Uh, that will elicit a conformational change that then will help uh, unlock uh, the other subunits of troponin and also tropomyosin to now move and wobble and diffuse away from uh, and open up these myosin binding sites on actin, permitting myosin to bind. Uh, that's actin. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So it really just comes down to the old theory is active movement or near what you have now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So calcium doesn't like even interact directly with myosin, it just inhibits. It inhibits the inhibitor. It inhibits the tropomyosin, which is the inhibitor of myosin binding to actin. Let me, uh, I'm going to make one adjustment. Um, it, so troponin is the inhibitor here. It's the inhibitory subunit. Uh, so you can envision that part of what helps to lock tropomyosin, the myosin binding sites. So like whenever something binds to another protein, like there's typically a specific binding site where that occurs. With actin and myosin, there are specific sites where myosin binds to actin and block. Put an eye together, help lock it in place. And see, so calcium comes in and it's going to act on troponin C. That is now going to uh, unlock troponin I, the inhibitory, inhibitory subunit, and help enable tro tropomyosin to... So calcium is inhibiting the inhibitor, and the inhibitor in this case is troponin I, the inhibitory subunit. Yeah. Okay. All right. So again, to kind of uh, quickly summarize the entire pathway, uh, calcium is, uh, in response to a neural trigger, calcium is released from the intracellular sores. That calcium will now, within uh, striated muscle, 
will bind to troponin C. That binding of, of calcium to troponin C will now unlock tr troponin I, the inhibitory subunit, and uh, ultimately unlock tropomyosin to now enable it to diffuse away and permit myosin to bind to actin, and it's now free to bind. So now that it's able to bind, uh, we're going to take a moment to try and describe what that contraction looks like as, uh, as defined by the actin myosin cross bridge cycle. So I explained earlier that the cross bridge cycle is kind of the interface between actin and myosin, and we're going to take a moment to describe uh, what happens there. So myosin, it's important to note this, myosin is an ATP ACE. So that means it's an enzyme for ATP. It is, that means it has an affinity to bind to ATP. So, so it's important to remember this. So we're, we're gonna constantly trying to build on what we've been learning so far. So it's important to remember that en uh, enzymes have an affinity for their substrate. Once they've, uh, once they have catalyzed, helped to catalyze a reaction, once that product is present, they don't really have an affinity for that. And they have an affinity for the substrate. So they'll typically release, this, release the product and, try, and uh, look for another molecule of the substrate. So we're gonna st start with step one where we have myosin ADP. So ADP bound to uh, myosin here, uh, and it's bound to the actin filament uh, in a contracted state or the rigor state. So, uh, the reason why this is called the rigor state is from days of yore, uh, when uh, patho when pathologists would look at sections of striated muscle, uh, they would typically see a lot of uh, end cadavers that are in a rigor state. They would see a lot of myosin ADP in a, in a contracted state. And so that's typically why this is called the rigor state. So what ends up happening is Myosin is an ATP ace, so it does not have an affinity for ADP. It will release ADP. And so now we have myosin with no ATP or ADP bound to it, uh, but myosin alone bound to an actin filament in step two. It is, and what's important to note is ADP bound to myosin uh, helps to increase the affinity for uh, myosin to bind to actin. And so what's going to end up happening here in the next step is that myosin is an ATP ace. So it's going to bind to ATP. But when bound to ATP, that will change the effect. So myosin will release from the film. And now uh, that we have a ATP bound to myosin, uh, it will uh, hydrolyze ATP to ADP with an inorganic phosphate present. And that is going to either cock or slide the myosin head in a forward direction. And now, as I said before, again, uh, ADP uh, increases the affinity of myosin to actin. So now that ATP has been hydrolyzed to ADP, what's going to end up happening is it rebinds to actin, okay? And when it loses that inorganic phosphate, and so, sorry, let me take one, I'm going to take one step back. I just realized I skipped something important. Um, so, once that, that is going to uh, induce that, uh, the, the sliding, a rebind, and now that it's rebound, when it loses this inorganic phosphate that has a charge, that's going to induce a conformational change and make the myosin head slide across the actin filament. And so again, to kind of like go through the cycle and walk through it slowly, step one, now we have, we're gonna start back at step one. We have ADP bound to uh, myosin that's bound to actin. It loses the ADP because it has an, it's an ATPase. It wants to bind to ATP. It loses ADP, binds to ATP. That changes the affinity between myosin and actin. So it releases away from the actin filament. It will hydrolyze ATP to ADP, and that will change the charge. It slides forward the myosin head, and once, and then it'll rebind uh, as well to the myosin uh, to the myosin to actin, because again, whether ATP is bound or ADP is bound matters. If you see ADP, 
it's going to be, you'll see myosin binding to actin. If you see ATP there, they're going to disassociate because that changes their affinity. Once it's hydrolyzed, it's going to change the conformation of the myosin head, and it's going to prompt uh, myosin to bind again to actin. Once that inorganic phosphate is lost, that's going to induce a conformational change because of change in charge, and the myosin head will slide. So this entire process uh, is the cross, cross bridge cycle. And that last conformational change on step five, when the inorganic phosphate is lost, we call it the power stroke. I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna give space for a couple of questions to form and percolate there. Mm -hmm. Inorganic phosphate is one key precursor. Correct. That is when uh, so the hydrolysis is hydrolysis is typically when a uh, water molecule is present within the chemical reaction, and so that changes the um, the surrounding molecules on the uh, on the phosphate group, and so the inorganic phosphate is just when via hydrolysis, that phosphate that's off to the side, that's a permitted to uh, diffuse away and be recycled to turn subsequent ADPs back into ATP here. Does that make sense? All right. So, let me just say that's the same Is there a organic? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll throw us on another hand. Okay. Yes. Yes. The the binding of myosin actin. There's a there's a, a an actual myosin binding site on actin. No, you're good. All right, we'll keep moving. So uh, if we were to apply this to uh, flagella or cilia, uh, there's a similar uh, power stroke and recovery stroke that occurs there as well along tubulin. Um, and there's uh, and it occurs a uh, along the entire length of the beating cilium. And when you look at it, it, it it's present uh, and it occurs via the ax axonemal dynein, where there's the same dynamics at play, just along multiple times along the length of the beating flagella. So we're talking about this at like a single, uh, a single. So we're thinking we've been looking at this basically at within a single sarcomere and then within a single myosin head binding to actin. But if you look at this at a more macroscopic scale, these interactions enable uh, really uh, really complex movements. I mean, you, you can think of it even beyond just the simple uh, beating flagella. I mean, this is constantly happening as you're picking up your pencil and writing and doing fine motor movements or larger gross movements. So now we're going to switch gears and move towards the regulation of contraction on uh, non striated muscle, in this case, smooth muscle. So this is going to be slightly more representative of how most myosin types are regulated. Uh, up to this point, everything has just been on striated muscle, and that's typically uh, myosin type two, and I believe myosin type five. There's lots of other isoforms or types of myosin, and what we're gonna talk about now uh, is characteristic of the, the regulation of those other myosin species. Uh, and this is predominantly based on actin uh, and not, uh, the regulation that we're going to be talking about is primarily at the myosin level. And this is primarily accomplished by phosphorylation of that regulatory light chain that we talked about earlier. And the phosphorylation on that regula regulatory light chain is induced indirectly by uh, calcium flux. So we talked again about how on a myosin head, we have the essential light chain and we have the regulatory light chain. And so the regulatory light chain is where that phosphorylation occurs. And it occurs primarily on these two amino acid residues, uh, threonine 18 and serine 19. Uh, does anyone happen to remember the third amino acid that can be phosphorylated? In terms of just like in general among amino acids, there's 
threonine and serine, and there's a third one, not histine. I think I just heard someone whisper it. Tyrosine. Yeah. Uh, and so for regulatory lysine, uh, the threonine 18 and serine 19, and the numbers denote their amino acid position. Those are, those are where the phosphorylation occurs. And if you remember, uh, an, an enzyme that promotes phosphorylation or that mediates ph phosphorylation is called a kinase. Uh, enzymes that uh, remove phosphorylation or remove that phosphate group uh, are called phosphatases. And so what's important to note here is that the kinases that do this ph phosphorylation on the regulatory light chain are calcium dependent. I'm gonna repeat that one last time. The, kinase, the kinases that mediate, uh, the kinases that mediate the phosphorylation on the regulatory light chain are calcium dependent. That is how this is a, uh, that is how this is, uh, it, calcium is indirectly uh, informing what happens here. And a lot of what we're gonna describe, and a lot of what occurs uh, in myosin, um, myosin actin uh, cross-bridge cycling here is pretty similar to what we described before, where there is a uh, phosphorylation event at the regulatory light chain. Myosin moves away from the actin filament. The hydrolyzation uh, induces the uh, head to move forward. It rebinds the actin. And then once the phosphate group is removed, the power stroke occurs. And again, the same process is occurring as was happened as we described on the previous slide. But the main difference here is that this is regulated by phosphorylation of the regulatory light chain. So in non-muscle myosin, the way this will look is this is inactive here. We'll have a phosphorylation event at the regulatory light chain. This becomes active and uh, permits myosin to bind to actin. Um, on kinesin, a molecular motor that we talked about at the very beginning of the lecture, uh, it's not a phosphorylation event, but rather there's a cargo binding domain where vesicles will bind to kinesin and permit the opening of that molecular motor. And it actually possesses and still holds onto the vesicle uh, for transport across uh, tubulin here. So to take it all back to heart failure, uh, we described heart failure at the very beginning of the lecture as decreased contractility of uh, the heart muscle, the myocardium. And there are multiple ways by which this can happen. Uh, it can happen because of loss of cardiac myocytes. Uh, what's really important to note is that um, cardiac myocytes or cardiomyocytes are what uh, are best described as post-mitotic, meaning that once if you lose cardiomyocytes, the surrounding cardiomyocytes cannot proliferate and grow to repopulate and um, recoup what was lost. So if you think about uh, typical wound healing, if you, think about, uh, if you think about a cut on your skin, typically there's proliferation of fibroblasts on your skin, there's proliferation of lots of other cells that come in and will actually pull together, physically pull things together, but also your epiderm, the, um, your epithelial cells in your skin will also grow to replace what was lost. Cardiac myocytes do not do that. They are post-mitotic, they cannot uh, grow back. And so there's been a lot of efforts in tissue engineering and regenerative medicine to find new ways to introduce new cardiomyocytes. And um, one really exciting way that's been uh, employed to do that is the use of induced pluripotent stem cells um, or trying to use other endogenous stem cell populations to try and do that. Um, the loss in contractility also compromises tissue integrity. There's further uh, reduced availability of ATP, calcium recycling and uh, sarcomeric abnormalities. One drug that's been developed to try and address this in heart failure is omicamativ uh, macarbal. Uh, the idea here is to try and treat what you can. And so it tries to increase the rate of force generation by altering the kinetics of myosin actin interactions. And it typically what it'll do is it'll bind to myosin, uh, cardiac myosin specifically, allosterically. Again, allosterically means to work from a distance. So it's not binding to the active site, it's, it's an enzyme, it, it's an ATPase, but it's not binding to the active site. It's binding on another region, a regulatory region of myosin and, re and regulating its activity there. And it's trying to increase the rate 
the transition rate of myosin generating force here. And so what this looks like is <clears throat> it is trying to overcome, it's trying to overcome the existing energy barrier uh, to go from, uh, what I should have mentioned before is that there's a weak binding state that we've denoted up top. And what's down here is more strong. So when we have ADP uh, bound to uh, myosin that's binding to actin, this is a stronger interaction. It's ATP or ADP with that phosphate group. Those are binding states between myosin and actin. And so what omicamativ is trying to do is increase, uh, change the energy kinetics here so that the weakly bound state becomes a more strongly bound state and change the transition rate of uh, the entire cross bridge cycle. And what this looks like in patients with heart failure, uh, we have a patient to the left with no drug treatment and actually see ventricular contraction uh, is uh, improved dramatically where you can have more contraction of the ventricle, uh, permitting more blood ejection and uh, better life outcomes. And the ultimate function of this is that it is increasing cardiac output. If heart failure or molecular motors uh, sounds really interesting, uh, here are a couple of folks in our uh, research community that are working in this area. Uh, and before I stop there, I want to give space for any more questions. Yes. So does this fire out the heart more quickly? Uh, like, does it create the peak long, long term and other you can make side effects? Uh, I actually, so I don't think it's going to tire out the heart. Um, I don't know the side effects. I will actually look that up. I don't know the side effects of Omicamative, but I'll get, the, I'll get back to you on that. I'll post that in an announcement. Um, are there any other questions? All right. Uh, I think we'll be finishing early today. Uh, thanks for your time, and I'll be up here for any questions. Yeah.